you're watching a film called Svengali from 1931. It's the story of an unkempt singing teacher named Svengali who meets a lovely young milkmaid and artist model named Trilby O'Farrell. The strange old man becomes obsessed with her and uses his strange powers of hypnotism to put her under his control. To separate her from her boyfriend, he fakes her death and uses his strange powers to make her a famous singing star. The star of the film was the American actor of stage, screen, and radio, John Barrymore. Barrymore was one of the most respected actors of the day. The blonde-haired, innocent-looking female actor who plays the part of Trilby was 17-year-old Marion Marsh. Actually, her name was Marilyn Morgan. No, it was Violet Krauth. Anyway, this was her first major role in a Hollywood film. Less than a year earlier, she was just another high school student at Hollywood High School. She was born Violet Etheredd Krauth in the British West Indies, which is now Trinidad and Trabango, on October 17, 1913. Her parents were Leo and Harriet Morgan Krauth. She was the youngest of four children, having two older brothers and a sister. She said that when she was six years old, she had memories of being chased by an alligator. When she was about eight years old, due to World War I, the family moved to Boston, Massachusetts. In 1925, her older sister Harriet was one of the first 18 students chosen to open the Paramount Picture School in New York City. One of her fellow students was Thelma Todd. Having her sights set on the movies, Harriet moved to Los Angeles, California, and her family went with her. She landed a job as a contract player with the Film Booking Offices of America, known as FBO Studios. She took the name of Jean Morgan and began to appear in small film roles. Meanwhile, little sister Violet attended the Lacanti Junior High School and after Hollywood High School. She began to appear in school plays and was chosen to be part of an acting group called the Little Theater Guild. By 1929, when Violet was only 16 and still in high school, she was given a six-month contract with Pathé Studios and began using the name Marilyn Morgan. Poor Marilyn. Poor little Marilyn Morgan. Marilyn goes to two schools, Hollywood High School and Pathé Junior Stock Company School conducted by Frank Riker, who is training a selected group composed mostly of unknowns for possible future stardom and talkies. That's no misfortune, of course, but this is. She's only 16 and scarcely looks that. With most of her fellow pupils, she was given a small part in Joe College. Now the picture is completed, they've decided they may have to cut her out because she doesn't look old enough to even be a freshie. Probably no girl in Hollywood has been luckier than Marilyn Morgan, Pathé player. Only 17 years old, she came to Los Angeles from her birthplace in the island of Trinidad, West Indies, and won a Pathé contest with no previous experience on stage or screen. With Hollywood filled with beautiful girls lured to the coast with dreams of a screen career, Marilyn's luck borders on miraculous. While she wasn't given much to do at Pathé, they did train her to be an actor. Her only film role I can find was an uncredited role in The Sophomore. Now the story goes that one day Marilyn, along with her brother, who was going under the name of Eddie Morgan, visited their older sister Jean Morgan at the Goldwyn Studios. Violet Krauth a chance visit of 16-year-old Violet Krauth to the Goldwyn Studios where her sister, known as Jean Morgan, was at work, resulted in a contract to work in Whoopi with Eddie Cantor, according to Miss Harriet Krauth, who went to the courthouse so Superior Judge McComb could approve Violet's contract. The young actress took the name of Marilyn Morgan, by which she will be known henceforth, it was stated. Her sister Jean recently was nominated by Henry Klein, artist, as the most beautiful showgirl in America. What is it? What has happened? Oh, look, it's a big link. Here, you, get out of the way. I can't stand this. I'm a very nervous man. Give me something. Give me something. Yeah. What do you give me? What is it? No, no, don't don't you. Up. Get out of the car, everybody. Line up front. Come on. We'll let you have a couple of gallons. Yes? You let me have anything that I want. Father, he doesn't know who you are. Who cares? From their visit to the studio to see their sister, both Marilyn and Eddie received contracts with Warner Brothers. It was now her older sister's quest to make her little sister a star. Sister Story 
When Marilyn Morgan, pretty little high school girl, was released from the now disfunct Pathé Studio Training School, where she had been playing small parts and bits, her elder sister Jean, extra and showgirl on musical pictures, was determined the kid should have her chance. Practically forgetting her own career, she plugged away at Marilyn's and spent most of her time looking for film work for the youngster. And with her new contract, she had a new name. She was now Marion Marsh. Soon, she came to the attention of Howard Hughes, who gave her a bit part in the film, Hell's Angels. There's the man I'd like to kiss. What's the matter? Afraid of a kiss? <laughs> Now, while her Warner Brothers contract had, at first, not amounted to much, she auditioned and received a part in the play The Young Sinners, and it was a huge hit. The stage play Young Sinners was being cast downtown. My agent arranged a tryout for me and I went down, read a few lines, and, totally unexperienced, was given the part. I was so glad to actually get started that I signed the stage contract then and there, even though I knew that Warner Brothers and my mother would have to agree to make it legal. Marion Marsh, calmly blonde who, as Marilyn Morgan was a featured player with Warner Brothers, is the hottest sinner. Now, due to the play, the film industry was starting to take an interest in Marion Marsh, and apparently Warner Brothers was having a few issues. Marion Marsh, the attractive little blonde leading woman of Young Sinners, which enjoyed a successful run at the Belasco, is receiving all sorts of screen offers these days. Though under contract to Warner Brothers, Miss March is free to make pictures for other studios until her own studio opens again, which will be shortly after the first of the year. Her offers included the next George Arliss film, Red Hot Sinners, and even Warner Brothers had the idea for her to be in the lead in a film called Bad Women, but it just so happened that John Barrymore was having a problem. He had been in the play Trilby, based on the novel by George de Maurier, and was planning a film version of the story. His plan was to have his wife, Dolores Costello, star in the role of the title character, but Dolores, who had recently had a baby, retired from pictures. The next actress, Evelyn Lay, was suffering from an illness and had to pass. It just so happened that somebody at Warner Brothers noticed Marilyn Marsh's resemblance to Costello. Marsh was brought to the home of Mr. Barrymore, who was sick at the time, and he approved her taking the role. Years later, Marion described the meeting with Barrymore. Has anyone ever remarked, Barrymore asked, that you resemble my wife Dolores? Yes, I said. Who, asked Barrymore. And I said, the butcher on Vine Street who gives me liver for my cat. Well, Barrymore just laughed his head off. Marion Marsh gets coveted role of playing opposite John Barrymore in his next picture. Miss Marsh is a new find in Hollywood. Who are you? Who are you? Me? I'm a model. I work for Durian upstairs. He sent me down for Monsieur Taffy and the lad to look at. A model, huh? <laughs> for a moment, I thought you were a gendarme. Oh, I pose in these. Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gecko, wait outside. But, Maestro. So we will not miss our friends. But, you need a model? All the artists say I have a very classic figure. Durian, Mallow. My dear young lady, I don't doubt it. As far as I can see. Shall I show you? Well, uh... Oh, I'd be glad to. Perhaps you can use me sometime. Gives Jean the credit. Jean seemed to know all the time that I would get the part, but I wasn't so sure about it myself, Marion remarks. She kept my spirits up by telling me that I would, though, and sure enough, I did. All this talk about how much I've done for Marion is a lot of bunk, Jean told me. I haven't done anything for her. She has the looks and the ability, and that's why she's been successful. I merely made the point of seeing to it that Jean was brought to the attention of the right persons. They did the rest. To which Marion replies, I don't know what I would have done without Jean, but one thing is sure. I would never be where I am today. 
As Marion got older, Jean says, I believed she was the family's best bet, so I concentrated on her. First, I got her a part in Whoopi, and a real agent saw her and sold her to Warner Brothers on a long-term contract. Gee, it was great to see her play opposite Barry Moore in her first picture, and she's going to be in another with him. During production, Barry Moore offered her a bit of advice that she took very seriously. Don't be just another Hollywood playgirl. Conduct yourself with the dignity befitting a lady and producers will respect you as one. Now, even though the picture wasn't as successful as the studio had hoped, Marion became a star, even if she wore that ridiculous wig throughout the film. Miss Marion Marsh, who plays the part of Trilby in Spengali, is the sensational screen find of the year. She possesses the rare loveliness of face and form, and the ability to actually become the part she portrays. Trilby, which requires all the gamut of feeling, is one of the finest characterizations ever given. Marion Marsh plays the part of Trilby with rare understanding. Her fragile and flower-like loveliness is seen to marvelous advantage. She was soon scheduled to appear in Barrymore's next film. Originally titled The Genius, it was released as The Mad Genius. But there were a few films in between. I think I'll create a diversion and go like this. Renee! Oh, it is a bore, and you know it. You're too young to be bored. Well, if this keeps on, I shall either have to turn you over my knee or run for home. In the first place, I'd scream. In the second, I'd run after you. I've been dying to see your bungalow anyway. You wouldn't like it. Orgies, terrible goings on. I wouldn't be a bit frightened, even of being alone with you. In my bungalow? Uh-huh. Wouldn't it be thrilling? I think there's something wonderful about a secret shared by two people. It certainly gives the rest of the community something to talk about. Must you treat me like a child? I hope not. I guess you think we're an awful superstitious family, darling. But Mother wouldn't hear about getting the license until the last minute. And you, you own this paper. You write editorials and sign them. You attack everything. You're a crusader in shining armor. Where is my mother? Where is my father? Why don't you answer me? Who are you to condemn people to death? Does it please you to hurt me that way? Ooh, what makes you think I wish to hurt you, Nana? You ask me that question when all the time you know everything about Fedor. Hmm. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Fedor, dancing in a Montmartre cabaret. Who sent him there? Why, my dear child, you did. She was such a great success that even a trip to New York was considered a big deal. She's not quite 18. She has lovely hazel eyes, soft blonde curly hair, much more beautiful than the wig she wore in Svengali. She is 5 feet 2 inches tall and weighs about 102 pounds. She says she likes to cook and for relaxation drives her little Ford out into the country taking her Persian kitten Precious along for company. Marion Marsh, Warner Brothers player vacationing in the East, made a trip to Washington and called on President Hoover on Friday. Honors Young Stars Being named a Wampus Baby Star is one of the highest honors filmdom can bestow upon an aspiring actress. What were the Wampus Baby Stars? The Wampus Baby Stars was a promotional campaign sponsored by the United States Western Association of Motion Picture Advertisers. They honored 13 young actresses each year whom they believed was on the threshold of movie stardom. Marion was one of the 13 to make the 1931 group. Film actress disagrees over penitentiary movie. Louise Fendenza, screen comedian, has changed her mind about making a prison picture. 
I always wanted to do a prison part, but I was told that it was out for me. I understand that now, she said, visiting the prison. There is no comedy in a penitentiary. Marion Marsh, however, one of the newest blonde picture stars, thinks it would be thrilling to act in a prison picture. Furthermore, she prefers San Quentin should she ever have to serve a term. If I were ever sent to prison, I hope it would be San Quentin, she said. The woman's department seems to be just like a clean, well-managed girl's school. The two actresses were in a party of movie notables shown through the prison. Now, after being in major films with actors like Edward G. Robinson, Boris Karloff, and William Powell, Warner Brothers thought it was time for Marion to be a big-name star. But Marion had other ideas. Extra shies at stardom. When screen actress refuses offer like that, it's news. Marion Marsh, who is 17 years old and already has some highly important parts in the movies, among them Five Star Final and Spengali, says she has no desire to be a star. Miss March, demure and shy, said she had been informed recently by Warner Brothers that they intend making her one, and she protested vigorously because she did not feel she was ready for stardom yet. Of course I want to be a star, Miss March told them, but only when I'm quite sure I can measure up to it. So the studio gave way to her, and her next picture, instead of being billed as Marion Marsh in Under 18, will be Under 18 with Marion Marsh. Where did the press agent disappear to? I'm not ready for it yet, said the little blonde actress with the earnestness that is characteristic of her when really serious subjects are under discussion. Please don't go too fast about this. Of course I want to be a star, but only when I'm quite sure that I can measure up to it. Give me a little more time. Like all actresses in Hollywood, rumors of her love life began. Marsh Oki Ty just imagined, for Marion can't. Marion Marsh, 1931 Wampus Baby star, emphatically denies reports of her engagement to Jack Oki, screen comedian. Engaged to Jack Oki? Certainly not, declared Miss Marsh. Why, I only met him once several years ago. I don't see how anybody could imagine I was engaged to him. But as far as her love life, even at the age of 18, Marion wasn't in any rush. I've never been kissed by a man outside of business hours, and my business happens to be motion pictures, said Marion without signs of challenge in her voice. And then she added, and I don't intend to be until I marry. Some experts declare that when a girl says no, she means yes, but for the casual observance, it would be the writer's guess that Marion means just what she said. Youthful Marion Marsh, who will be seen at the Ritz Theater Wednesday and Thursday next in Warner Brothers' romantic drama Under 18, her first starring vehicle, said recently to an interviewer who was commenting on her rapid rise to stardom that she credited the good fortune to her stars rather than herself. My sister and I visited a Hollywood astrologer last fall, more for a lark than anything else, and he told us that the planets were just right for me, and that 1931 would be crowded with luck, said Miss March, adding naively. Do you think there is anything in astrology, though? Really? I suppose I'm good material for fortune tellers, she said, laughing. Not that I really believe in it, but it's fun. I do believe in premonitions. I had something tell me to pass up what seemed like an attractive contract in favor of another and seen it work out for the best. I love you. 
That's the cue for us to go up in the doorway. Come on. Deadly weather for this sort of thing. Oh. oh, I'll say so. Gee, what I could do to a kook. Look out now. You don't like that kind of talk, do you? No, and I don't like it either. Get you. Oh, Lotsey, don't you realize what you've done? Our hopes, our plans, our love. I realize. 11751, please. The Vienna Market? Mr. Marks is Susie Sachs. Will you please send some things up to my mother at once? Five pounds of flour, two pounds of dog meat, one pound of coffee, the best, and a dozen eggs, and two pounds of butter. No, no, one pound. I mustn't spend too much. Order what you need. You shall have an advance in celery. And six cans of sardines, and a half a pound of chocolate, and a few frankfurters. The big ones? Yes, yes, the largest. Yes, yes, the largest. The salary will be... It would seem everything was going great for Marion, but in the spring of 1932, Marion and Warner Brothers parted ways. There were many reasons given. The papers liked to play up the money aspect, but there were other reasons. Marion wasn't happy with the part she was given, always being asked to play the good girl characters. On top of that, she was feeling stressed and burnt out over the workload that she was required to do. Although it had been just over a year, she felt she needed to get out. And unfortunately, this really hurt her career, one that she never really recovered from. Joan Blondell and Marion Marsh are said to be demanding more money from Warners. The trouble I hear is due to the unequal division of salaries between these younger players and the older but less popular stars. Now Marion Marsh is shouting for the rewards of stardom and Joan Blondell demands that her $500 per be boosted to $1,500. The same studio where James Kegney had his recent losing battle announced that the reports that Joan Blondell and Marion Marsh also were holding out for more salary increases were not exactly all the wool and far from being a yard wide. Both players they say are merely waiting for the proper types of roles. Marion Marsh, however, another of the little girls who snapped her fingers at $400 a week, although she was unheard of before John Barrymore made his version of Spengali and chose her for Trilby, will have her chance to collect as much as she can get at some other studio, but not at Warner's. Marion Marsh has secured her release from Warner Brothers. She will no doubt freelance. And for a replacement at Warner's, they hired another up-and-coming actress. Little Betty Davis, blonde, young and with ability, has been elected to take the place of Marion Marsh at Warner Brothers. Marion Marsh, who has just signed an RKO contract, will have a leading feminine role in all the evidence. The film would be released under the title Strange Justice. And she began writing a column in the newspaper called My Beauty Hints. Marion Marsh and Poland Banks, the author, are said to be tee -hee. And of course, the first of many rumors, because she was working for RKO, about her and Howard Hughes began to appear in the paper. Howard Hughes devoting himself to Marion Marsh at Aqua Caliente. He flew there and back in his sumptuous new amphibian plane. Howard Hughes devoting his time between Marion Marsh and Sandra Shaw. Marion would deny for the rest of her life that there was anything romantic between her and Hughes, and I have no reason to believe otherwise. I always called Howard Hughes my big brother. There was no romance, but we got on together. He liked having me around and I enjoyed being with him. But no romance. He was interested in me that way, but I was too young and not the least bit interested in that sort of thing. I was still riding horses and playing tennis. It had been two years since Marion Marsh made her famous film with John Barrymore, and now her career was seen as being on a downward slide. She turned to Universal to do something a bit different. Well, out at Universal, where Marion Marsh has been playing sweet young things for a long time, she says she'll go mad if they don't give her something else to do. So she'll be a wicked woman and I like it that way and she is tickled. 
My father deserted my mother soon after they were married. Her letters to him were returned, and his lawyers wrote her that the marriage had been annulled. I learned all this two years ago when my mother died. All our lives we know nothing but poverty and struggle. Of that, nothing's too good for a friend of yours. Oh, that's very nice of him. And very nice of you, too. Could I meet Mr. Hoople? You know what the rest of it. Uh, Castle. Castle, and thank him for the favor. Sure, he wants to meet you, too. I'll go get him for you. By now, however, good roles were getting harder and harder to find, and some began to think that Marion Marsh's career was almost over. In an effort to revitalize her career, she took a film role in England. I was born in Trinidad and my mother is English, she told a reporter. Most of my life has been spent in the United States, however, and I am so glad to be in England at last. Marion Marsh will stay in London for another picture, All the King's Horses. Why wasn't I told? Why wasn't I told? T'was only by chance I met you. Nobody could forget you. After two or three pictures in Europe, she returned to the United States and the success of the pictures across the pond revitalized her career. My advice to any screen person who is given too many and insignificant roles is to chuck Hollywood and go abroad for some film work. Hollywood always rediscovers one who is made good in England or on the continent. Besides, it is a remarkable experience, she declared. I was particularly interested, she said, in the easy, nonchalant manner employed by British producers in picture making. It is utterly void of the factory-like bustle characterizing Hollywood productions. In England, if there's a good cricket match listed, the company will stop work to attend it. Here, of course, the old adage concerning business and pleasure strictly holds. The Britisher somehow seems to conveniently forget that such annoying realities as production schedules and routine exists. He is constantly jolly and exemplifies, strangely enough, the Dolce Farinetti spirit of the traditional Californian. Nevertheless, his work doesn't suffer in consequence and pictures are amazingly completed on time. Luck breaks in England. If things don't seem to be going well here, hop over to England for a couple of pictures and your luck will change. At least that's what happened to numerous local celebs, most recently among them Marion Marsh. After skyrocketing to stardom, Marion suddenly took a turn in the opposite direction. However, she still was in demand in England, so she went over there and made two pictures. About a month ago, she returned home to be greeted with offers on all sides. She signed with Monogram for the title role in Girl of Limber Lost, adopted from the novel by the late Gene Stratton Porter. Ham hocks and stale bread. Me. I'd better be hurrying. Uh, I'll be late. Oh, well, look what I found for your moth collection. It's all fixed in everything. Thank you, Uncle Wes. Oh, tut, tut. Now, you run along. You'll be late for school. Goodbye. And her reviews for Girl of the Limber Lost were wonderful. And watch Marion Marsh, the young girl who got off to such a big start and had to go to England to pull herself out of a slump, turns in the best performance of her life. And so, for the young actress, she went from an unknown to super successful to washed up and then a comeback and she was still in her early 20s. But all wasn't perfect in her world. Marion Marsh is entirely recovered from the effects of tomaine poisoning from which she had suffered more than two weeks ago. It was learned at Columbia Studios yesterday. Marion Marsh, blonde film actress, went to the Santa Ana racetrack at Arcadia today to have her picture taken with some horses. This afternoon, she was nursing a sore arm. Head play Mrs. Silas B. Mason's four-year-old winner of last year's Preakness posed with Miss Marsh and then bit her left arm. Columbia Pictures, where Miss Marsh is employed, reported, The injury is described as painful but not serious. Edmund Love and Marion Marsh are said to be in love. At least, they are seen together often at various cafes and nightclubs. Horseback riding is the favorite sport of Marion Marsh, blonde actress who plays opposite Boris Karloff in The Black Room Mystery. You know, my dear, if I ever decide to marry, I can think of no one who would make a more charming baroness than you. Thank you. Well, sir, you did indeed. 
May I have my hat? No. Why not? Because if I give you your hat and you go out wearing it in the storm, you won't catch cold or get pneumonia and I won't be able to bring flowers to the hospital or wear beautiful black clothes to your funeral. <laughs> and besides, I think your temper is recovered enough so you can go back and apologize to your superior officer. In 1935, Marion was offered her most important role since Bengali, and that was as Sonia in a film version of Crime and Punishment. This is my most important part to date, she said. It happened so easily. It took me two or three days to realize I was actually working on it. Joseph von Sternberg, whom I knew socially, met me on the Columbia lot one day. Thrusting a script into my hands, he asked me to read a few lines of Sonia. I read. He watched me. As I looked up, he inquired, How would you like to do that part? I should like it very much indeed, I answered, hoping against hope. Good, you're hired, he said, walking away. He didn't know it, but I had been reading the book and hoping I would be given the role. Marion Marsh wins extension. So many predictions are being made about the surprise performance that Marion Marsh will offer in Crime and Punishment that it is perhaps but natural that continuing of her contract should follow right on the heels of these forecasts. What use is that money to her? It could save a hundred lives like yours and mine. It's plain arithmetic. You could use some of her money, couldn't you? What will you do if you don't find her over? She ought to be stamped out. She would not say things like that. Black beetles squatting up there on her money box. It would be a service to humanity. Crime would be a strange way of serving humanity. Here it is, I found it. I don't know what I would have done without it. Why is it that all women weep when they are happy? My little brother and sister haven't had a thing to eat all day. Are you the only one to look after them? No, there's father. Only he drinks to forget his troubles. And the more he drinks, the more mother scolds. And the more she scolds, the more he drinks. So between the two, there's hardly any time left for us. I forgot there was still some kindness in the world. Thank you. I forgot there was still some beauty in it. And even though she'd only been in films for five years, the press was already calling this a comeback. But what the public didn't know about Marion, she had a secret. Something she thought was responsible for her continuing success. A little gold ring. I always think that as long as I have that ring, I shall have film work, she said. And that if I lost it or stopped wearing it, there would be a change. Someone, and I can't tell you who it was, gave it to me just as I was beginning in pictures. If I hadn't gone into pictures, I should have probably gone on to college and probably had an entirely different life. Because I got the ring then, I think it goes with pictures. Do that one large department store is all this city needs. Our business may not be as large as yours, Mr. Houston, but we cater to a family trade which is known as for 40 years and would never buy any place else. I'm offering you $75,000 for that tray. It's a lot of money. I'm sorry. I wish I knew which one is really you. Hmm? This is me. You're nothing like the man I saw that first night. No. That gang of kids said you're the swellest guy in the world. I always get along with kids. 
In early 1936, Marion had an emergency appendectomy. Thankfully, she fully recovered. Marion Marsh finds recuperating from an appendix jerking all the easier because polar player Gene Austin sends her buku flowers every twice a day. Now, while a polo player might have been sending her flowers, it was another man who captured her heart. Now, the papers incorrectly identified her new love as Randolph Scott, but it was actually Al Scott, a New York stockbroker, who had just recently divorced actress Colleen Moore. While they were engaged, they gave no clue to when and where it might happen. Rumors of when the wedding might take place were constantly appearing in the paper. Marion Marsh will shortly marry cameraman Al Scott. I'm not sure why they identified Al as a cameraman, but let's continue. Blonde Marion Marsh flashed a large square-cut diamond ring on her engagement finger today and admitted it was given to her by Al Scott, New York broker and former husband of Colleen Moore. For Marion, she began taking tennis seriously and played in tournaments, but some of the matches didn't go that well. And tennis wasn't her only hobby. Marion Marsh is an expert skydiver and ski jumper, which amounts to the same thing. Marion Marsh goes roller skating in the street in front of her home every morning for exercise. Marion Marsh is an expert skier. The actress took up the sport in Switzerland last winter. Now, for most of her career, Marion played in dramas, but early in 1937, she got the chance to try comedy playing in a Joey Brown film. Let's put on the feedback. Oh, you go ahead. I'll have my lunch later. Why won't you go with me? Well, I never eat with the boss. It's bad for the digestion. I haven't enough trouble. You have to turn me down. Your troubles are over, my friend. Do I have to listen to what you have to say? I thought you'd be curious. I'm not curious, but I would like to avoid a scene. Well, go on. Why didn't you tell me you're in such a panic to get married? I'm not in a panic to get married. I love Steve. I don't believe it. You're doing it for spite. You know, I owe you an apology. An apology? Yes, when this thing happened to us, I thought that you were... I guess you thought the same thing about me. I still can't figure it out. Neither could I until Danny told me how it happened. Danny? Danny Hinkle, my cellmate. He told me just how we were framed. But how? Marion, her sister, Jean Fenwick, and our two brothers, Tony and George Fenwick, decided recently to leave the big home in which they had all lived for many months. Memories of their mother, who died recently, were too much for them. They held a little family conference, and Miss March thought it would be better for her sister and two brothers to take a new home that was not too large, while she went to an apartment alone because she and Scott are soon to be wed. Angel Marsh Marion Marsh is angel of a growing business run by the boy next door, renting skates and secondhand bikes, the purchase of which Marion financed. Actress has novel sideline. Marion Marsh is quietly engaged in a side business that caters to Eastern visitors. The actress noticed how quickly her car sold when the buyer found out an actress once owned it. So she's purchasing $300 trailers, remodeling them to her taste and selling them for $1,000. So far this summer, eight of the Hollywood-decorated land homes have found their way into Eastern families. Al Scott's birthday gift to Marion Marsh, his fiancée, was a three-year-old, three-gated gelding. She named the horse Triple Threat. No exercise! Marion Marsh never does systematic exercise. Instead, she takes dancing lessons, which she feels develops grace of movement. Marion Marsh was catapulted to stardom opposite John Barrymore and Svengali before she was 18. Overcome by nervous breakdown, studio thought she was faking and blacklisted her. Made pictures in England and Germany. Has appeared under four names. Violet Krauth, her real name, and Violet Adams, Marilyn Morgan, and finally Marion Marsh. Is an accomplished singer and dancer. Has done neither on screen. Looks fragile but decidedly isn't controls a fiery temper, flies model airplanes, saves her money, lives quietly, promised to retire at 23 but didn't, wants one husband and lots of children. On March 29, 1938, Alan Marion finally secretly married. Who says they can't keep a secret? 
Ask Mary and Marsh and Al Scott, ex-husband of Colleen Moore, if they haven't kept one since last March. Yes, Doctor? You're late. Anything wrong? <laughs> no, nothing. You know, I hate to admit this, but um, you've got me thinking about the future again. I'm going to ask for that parole tomorrow morning. Oh, I'd hoped you would. I've worried about that. It's sort of a load off my mind. And off my chest. <laughs> well, I'd better get back no, to no, the No, 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 don't go, don't go yet. And at the same time of her marriage, Marion was involved in a gas explosion in her home. It must not have been too serious because she kept on working. On top of all that Marion had going on, she was also elected mayor of Chatsworth. Well, honorary mayor. It was the idea of the Chatsworth Women's Club. But Marion loved her home in Chatsworth and took her role as mayor seriously. I'm going to prove that a career girl can be just as efficient in the home and community as any other woman, or man for that matter, the diminutive blonde declared. I'm going to write a book someday, she confided, to Chamber of Commerce colleagues. The title will be How to Be a Good Honorary Mayor. Cookery expert, Marion Marsh, film starlet, has been taking a university course in advanced cookery and home economics. By this time, she still acted occasionally, but was spending more and more time dealing with her marriage. In 1940, she and Al Scott had a new home built, and allegedly, Marion went a little overboard with constant changes to the plans. This resulted in a lawsuit by the builder. Al tried to claim that Marion had no right to demand such changes and therefore he shouldn't have to pay. In the end, the court sided with the construction worker and Al was ordered to pay $2,130. In March of 1940, Marion reflected on her career in Hollywood. She talked about work after Svengali. I thought success had reached out its arms and embraced me, but I was mistaken. I found that I had to go through a few more disappointments. It took patience and perseverance to spend month after month of waiting at the telephone for a call to go to work. It took courage to go from this person to that person asking for a job, pleading for a chance to demonstrate what I could do. Doing all these things well enough and long enough eventually brings success knocking feebly at the door. Even then, it's only the beginning. I was told I was a fine actress, but I could not be photographed. I showed them that I could. I was told I could not play dramas, but I should stick to lighter roles. I showed them I could play drama. Yes, Hollywood is anybody's apple, but that apple is perched very high in the air, and to reach it takes courage and years of effort for most people. In March of 1940, she signed on to play at the San Francisco's World Fair. The idea was to let tourists see how films were made. Perhaps 12 is a favorite number. Sure, it's a great sport. Burying hatchets at midnight, especially in people. You may scoff, but I have a premonition of death. I believe she plans to kill us all. After which, she'll probably confess and say, Sheriff, I did it with my little hatchet. Oh, stop it. Stop it, O'Brien. When Marion asked why she came back into pictures, she replied, Oh, Hollywood's such a crazy place. I feel I belong here. In 1941, she filed for divorce from Al Scott. What's news? Marion Marsh and Al Scott have separated. She'll file suit for divorce after the first. Pending trial of her suit for divorce from Albert Scott, mining promoter, Marion Marsh, blonde film actress, will receive $200 a month in temporary support. Superior Judge Dudley S. Valentine ruled yesterday. Miss March, who originally sought $445 a month, testified that she has no home and has been forced to live with her sister and in friends' homes since separating from Scott three weeks ago. The last money I earned was $25 given to me by the Red Cross for demonstrating how to roll bandages, the young film player testified. I returned the check to them for the war relief. Marion Marsh appeared in the film House of Errors in 1942. 
it would be her last film. Listen, I don't even know your name. What is it, sweet? Oh, just call me by my number. 22. 22? And that's 30 for today. Listen, sweetheart, can't you understand? I love you. I'm crazy about you. But I can't get a marriage license until I know your name. What would the man think if I said, I, Jerry Fitzgerald, want to marry 22? They'd throw me in the clink. I'd be a fugitive from a psychopathic ward. Well, aren't you? Yes. I, I mean, no. Al Scott and Marion Marsh would call off the divorce and stay married for a long time, having two children. They remained married until 1959. In 1957, Marion returned to acting, appearing in two TV shows, but decided to give it up. I love acting, but I had become a professional because we needed the money, she said in 1985. In 1938, I married a businessman and just drifted away from my career. I had two daughters which kept me occupied for a while. I did appear on TV in the 50s in a teleplay with Gary Merle, and I made a pilot with John Forsythe, but I found I didn't much like work anymore, and I knew I had never really missed it. And that about wraps things up. In July of 1960, Marion married Cliff Henderson, an aviation pioneer and entrepreneur who she had met in the early 1930s. They moved to Palm Desert, California, a town Henderson founded in the 40s. Between playing golf and traveling, the Hendersons founded the nonprofit Desert Beautiful Conservation Group to promote environmental programs. The couple remained married until his death in 1984. Marion lived in Palm Desert for the rest of her life and spent a lot of time beautifying the area. Cathedral City was the most messy city ever, she told the Desert Sun in 1999. Every single vacant lot had broken down cars just dumped on all of them. The most important thing in my world, she says, is desert beautiful. We're losing what we had, and if we don't hold the line on the desert's beauty and the open space concept, we'll lose it forever. As the group's president, she organized volunteers to collect rubbish on vacant lots and other desert sites, initiated an early recycling program, and encouraged developers and city and county officials to include green belts, trees, and shrubbery on their property. On November 9th, 2006, in her home in Palm Desert, California, Marion Marsh Henderson passed away while sleeping. She was survived by her daughter Kathy and her son Al Jr. She had eight grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. She was 93 years old. She said she was particularly proud of her achievements in planting palm trees, commenting, if you want to leave something behind, plant a tree.